I made it. Thank you. Sorry about that. It's okay. No, some issues, but it happens. We're here. Um, we're all here. So yeah. So um, like I was saying just a moment ago, um, we're gonna kind of go off of some concepts from uh, Max Turner that I would just like to get your perspective on and see how you have you how you think it works with society in, in today's day and age. Well, since so, I haven't read Max Turner, I'm in a poor position to comment on his arguments. I, I understand. It's just too narrow a quote. It's not the whole argument, if that's okay. So um, just a second. He's got he, He's got this concept that that we're kind of heavy on. I think about like a grandfather clause, and it, it goes. The quote is, "The men of the future will not fight their way to many a liberty that we do not even miss." Um, we have the, both myself and uh, Zach here believe that the monetary system is kind of like it's transformed into quicksand, and that society is grandfather people's rights. If that if that makes Why sense. Why do you think the monetary system matters? Because is it's the foundation. The foundation of society is built. If, if it's not if it's not solid, and it's constantly you know evaporating, then it isn't constantly evaporating. The yeah. Most most modern societies have money, which doesn't change its value very much year to year. And insofar as people know that it's going to inflate gradually, they can take account of that in their transactions. Uh, agree to uh, agree that when you lend somebody ten dollars, you expect to get eleven dollars back because the dollars won't be worth as much when you get them back, and things of that sort. It seems to me that a lot of people put a lot of weight on monetary system and that i don't think the one we have is ideal and it has yes, certain sir. potential problems uh, but i think there's a tendency to overestimate that there's a as you may know one uh, canadian political party the social credit party which is basically built on the ideas of a monetary crank who thought that you could solve the problems of the world by only properly adjusting the monetary system. I've just been reading some stuff by early individualist anarchists who thought that if only you had free issue of currency, interest rates would be zero, which is nonsense. So yes, while I'm in favor of a uh, competitive private issue of currency, uh, and I think it would work somewhat better than our present system, I don't think it would uh, make the world enormously better. Yes. I'd, that, uh, oh. I'd like to... I'd like to follow up though, like for a free market society to coexist. And I think you kind of just uh, established it, but um, can a free market coexist with, with a monetary monopoly, Mr. Friedman? Well, that means that that particular part of the system isn't a free market, but I don't see other than that. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I think there are, the problem with monetary monopoly from my mm -hmm. standpoint, is that the issuers have the wrong incentives, uh, which mm -hmm. is, in a sense, from an economist standpoint, the problem with uh, lots of monopolies. Uh, mm -hmm. But the fact that they don't uh, create the optimal behavior of the money supply makes us a little bit worse off, but it doesn't mean that the free market collapses. After what do you all, think? you could have a free market with no money at all using, using gold, and... Mm -hmm that would still be a workable monetary system. It would be a monetary system only if there were one gold mining company in the world, in which case it would again be a monopoly. Uh, so so I, don't, I don't at least see why, why the fact that we have a government money issuing monopoly, uh, it doesn't strike me as one of the larger things wrong with the world, uh, although it is a small thing wrong with the world. Mm -hmm. you know, contributing factor, but not the not the largest uh -huh. issue that goes on, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, and, you know, you can even have a society using somebody else's money. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a sense in which there isn't really a monopoly because mm -hmm. you can, if you really want to, you can do transactions in pounds or in euros. Mm -hmm. It's just that most people find that less convenient and therefore uh, some people who are selling things won't accept payment in that. But mm -hmm. there certainly are places, I think, if you're 
my my guess is that in in, in parts of say in parts of, probably in London in, in parts of the UK where there are a lot of foreigners, I suspect that there are quite a lot of people who will take dollars, euros, or pounds more or less indifferently. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and in, for that matter, when I was in, huh, maybe Prague, one of the places I was in not that long ago, and they had their own, they were an EU country, but were not using the euro for some reason. So they had their own, I think, I think it was uh, Czech crowns or something. And mm -hmm. as far as I can tell, everybody was doing business in both the, almost everybody in both those and euros. Uh, so it wasn't really a monopoly. It was a uh, a duopoly, I suppose, for them. Yes, sir. Um, so I think what I, I'm trying to get at is with, with there only one, with there being only one monetary, not particularly one, because everyone has their own implementation because they're all, they're all have their mm -hmm. own monopoly and territory. And it's, it's funded through their own a monetary system. But through the central bank, through the, the concept of the central bank, it's kind of difficult for people to branch out and diverge and create their own culture if everyone if there is only Why so many you people create your own culture uh you can do pretty much the same culture whether you're using dollars euros or bitcoins mm. so what i mean is that it becomes too expensive to sustain that culture because of everybody needs to be in, in compliance under, under the a narrow selection of how, how, how does using dollar limit your culture seems to me i can imagine an awful lot of uh for example uh romani uh in the u.s have their own culture but they still use dollars uh haredi uh the extreme orthodox jews in the u.s have their own culture and they still use dollars so i don't really see how uh, having a monopoly currency prevents multiple cultures. It prevents multiple monetary systems, and uh, that has some disadvantages. But so hmm. I'm thinking. Uh, what, what I mean is, there's, there's, n it's difficult to be neutral between the di yeah. between different cultures because everyone has to be subservient to everybody else. There's. I, I don't understand. How does the fact that everybody's using dollars or everybody's using gold or everybody's using euros make everybody subservient to everybody else? Because, sorry. When I, when I say this, it's because people have divergent, you know, opinions about social issues and stuff like that. Right. And but as far as I know, Trump and Biden both use dollars. Yes. Yeah. And there's different perspectives, you know, this cul-de-sac of ideas. So when I say that <laughs> I'm sorry. I I, I I guess what he's uh what what he what my partner in crime is trying to <sighs> ask is uh it, it's uh it's hard to be neutral on the segment because of the centralization that comes about because of like a central bank contributing uh currency mechanism such as the dollar or it could be the euro or the pound how, how maybe, does how like does the existence of a monopoly currency result mm -hmm. in centralizing the economy you could have after all we had a, a monopoly currency in the 19th century when the economy mm -hmm. was a good deal less centralized mm -hmm. uh, e england had a monopoly currency in the mm -hmm. 18th century uh, yeah. the economy was much less central i just don't see the connection i mean the the, the... okay so let me, th let me let me go back to uh say the mormons how mm -hmm. they they went to a, a territory that was neutral that they could implement their own perspective right mm -hmm. It becomes too it, the the longer society co uh, collaborates and integrates, it becomes more and more difficult for us to have that option to to start to create a new roadmap. Is what I'm. That's what I'm trying to get at. If, huh. if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. 
Yeah, first, I don't think that had anything, anything much to do with monopoly currency. And I'm not sure if it's true or not. That is, it's it's certainly true that there aren't places that are open, that are empty in the sense in which what's now Utah was at the time that the Mormons made their trek and found mm -hmm. Salt Lake City. On the other hand, because of the technology we're using at the moment, you can have non-geographical communities more easily than we could before. So for mm -hmm. example, I spend a fair amount of time each day, I would think online on a uh, internet forum, uh, mm -hmm. which is, I don't know how many people, but let me guess a hundred people, maybe a bit more than that. And it's got its own customs and its mm -hmm. own ways of doing things. And it's, you know, once in a while I get plunged into the outside world and mm -hmm. it feels pretty foreign to me because here I've been arguing with all these reasonable people, reasonable people with a very wide range of views, mm -hmm. but they more or less all agree that you ought to have logical arguments for things and that disagreeing is not attacking with somebody and so forth. And it seems to me that there are a lot of things like that, that I have also spent a good deal of time over, over various parts of my life in a, a hobby having to do with historical recreation. And that's a subculture. It's a subculture with its own customs, with people feeling very strongly about identifying with it, that sort of it's us versus them, only us is not geographical. So although it's true that geographically the possibilities for separating, setting up separate cultures are worse and will be until probably, well, until we either have practical space flight or are better than we are at living underwater, uh, those being the two Uncla large unclaimed areas, the seafloor and, and space. Uh, mm -hmm. But but short of that, I agree, we, we've got fewer possibilities for physical isolation, but I think more possibilities for uh, non-geographical communities. So um, I think, let me put this, maybe put it this way. And uh, it, it, we, can, it can, we can be agreeable that there are people that think that certain actions are a, a form of social pollution. Yes. And there are certain actions mm -hmm. that are socially socially pure. What, how do you prevent the hijacking of one side over the other? Yes. In direct conflict? No, I agree. That is one of the things that you could not do legally via virtual communities is have polygamy, which was one of the things that the Mormons wanted to do. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, even yeah. with that, given the present legal framework, you could, in fact, have a polygamous family. You just wouldn't would have to be careful not to call it marriage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are no legal mm -hmm. restrictions on how many women a man can be living with or sleeping with. Uh, so but but it, but but certainly there are things you wouldn't be able to do. Uh, I, I agree with with that, because you there are way that there are some ways in which uh, geographical isolation gives you things that uh, you don't get otherwise. On the other hand, if you think about it, go go back to the to the 19th century when the Mormons were separating. There was another community uh, called the Oneida Commune, which yes, was, I think, even yeah. weirder than the than the Mormons. I don't Way know more weirder. Weird. Yeah, it, it, it was a group family where basically mm -hmm. all the men slept with all the women. Mm -hmm. And it was, I suppose, maybe 100 or 200 or 300 people, something on that order. It was a commune, mm -hmm. a, a religious commune, which more or less collapsed when the founder finally gave up on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was in, 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 in what, up, upstate New York, I think. It was not, it had not gone off to a geographical different place. It was just... Now, it's probably true that it would be harder to do that, the equivalent of that today, uh, mm -hmm. that that particular one you could do today, because there's nothing illegal about what they were doing. But yeah. if you wanted to do something which, well, I guess there probably was, they, they may well have been, some of the women may have been under our current, uh, current age of consent. I'm not sure what the age limits were were in that family. But certainly mm -hmm. there are things, if you wanted to have a group a commune with everybody sleeping together and some of the women were 16, you couldn't do it in California because if you got caught, you'd go to jail. Mm -hmm. So there are ways in which the lack of geographical isolation limits what you can do. Uh, 
but you can still do an awful lot of doing your own culture. As I mentioned the, the Romani, who are an interesting case, because they have been, to some extent, still are a very different culture in the middle of the U.S. and Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, Another one is the Amish as well, because they, they've yes. branched off on, they've kept to their, their whole ordeal. Some segments have uh, utilized modern technology but for the most part they stay in their little niche and you know the Amish are very interesting people mm -hmm. uh, there's a sense in which they're more modern than the rest of us mm -hmm. because their attitude to technology is to decide which technologies will or won't disrupt their social system so mm -hmm. it's not that they object to any new technology mm -hmm. it's that they they in a very decentralized way because each 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 individual mm -hmm. Uh, Amish uh, community makes its own rules. Uh, mm -hmm. and even community is too large, but uh, the but essentially they they discuss the question of will this particular technology be bad for mm -hmm. us? And if it mm -hmm. is, we all agree not to use it. And if it isn't, we use it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we experiment a little bit and we haven't decided on something and some people use it and some don't. And then we see how mm -hmm. it works out and maybe we shut it down or maybe we don't. The Amish are really yeah. interesting people from that standpoint there. They, they really are. Uh, so. But that's, but you're right that, that the Amish are maybe the best example, mm -hmm. the largest example. Well, there are probably more Amish than Romani. I'm not sure about the numbers, uh, but certainly a large example. And of course, they're also uh, gradually becoming larger. The, the Amish are outbreeding the rest of us by quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doubling time, population doubling time is about 20 years. Mm -hmm. So that means that in a century, if we if they can keep it doing, there will be 32 times as many of them as there are now, at which point they become a significant fraction of them. I'm not sure what the total population is, but it, I wouldn't be surprised if there are as many as a million Amish now, but I'd have to look it up. Uh, yes, yeah, no, there, but 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 in fact, you know, the world is more diverse than than is all, all often obvious, uh, mm -hmm. and and the Amish have done a pretty good job of uh, winning their conflicts with the government in the sense that the Amish uh, have managed to get out of compulsory schooling. That I think the usual system is that you have to go to school up to something like eighth grade, but not through high school as everybody else does. Uh, furthermore, that school can often be uh, a Amish one room or two room schoolhouse in which the grades are mixed, uh, which does not meet the requirements of anybody else's private school under state regulation, uh, but mm -hmm. they managed to get away with it. Uh, that uh, the, in, in a sense, the, well, there's a sense in which the difference between the Amish and the and the Romani is the Amish have always had much better PR. Uh, and I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure how, but they've managed to persuade other people that they're just romantic 19th century farmers, which they aren't. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore, we all think it's isn't that neat. Anyway. Yeah. So that, that term, you, that, that you just said they've been able to get away with, with that. Yes. There's... There seems to be a force comply a, a, a slow but steady force compliance within the Amish community that forcing them to modernize. Um, In what sense? Well, I I saw recently that there that the United States government has, has been forcing them to follow their regulations. Regulations on what? I don't know. I did, didn't see whatever story it was. Um. I can't. Uh, it was a little while ago. I can't remember exactly, but I mean, I, I could pull it up. But, the, but this, the this, this, the Amish. There was yeah. a point where the U.S. government was trying to force the Amish uh, to pay Social Security tax. And yes, I think that one number might have been what it was. Yeah, they were trying to force Amish kids to go to school, and ultimately the governments, the state and federal governments, backed down on that. Yeah. One of them, the Amish won a Supreme Court case unanimously. Oh, I know. Like, think think back to the uh, the Kashekta brothers during uh, during FDR's reign. How they were they were trying to force them to follow uh, 
modern prince uh, modern principles, but they 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 insisted on being able to, to follow their religious practices. I'm That's, afraid I don't know the case you're describing. It's, okay, uh, um, it's it's a case against the USDA. Um, over the the, in Gesche the, Gesche yeah. the Gesche brothers were uh, were, were Jewish butchers who were who were trying to follow their religious perspective mm -hmm. on how to prepare meat, and the USDA overstepped its boundaries. I see. Yeah. So, yeah, but but I mean, th those conflicts have existed for a long time. I'm just not sure yeah. that whether it's getting worse or better. And I suspect that, like most things, it's getting worse in I, some ways and better in others. Yeah. So, yeah, I, like I was uh, sorry. Speaking of that uh, that issue right now, it's uh, the Amos Miller Farm in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's yeah, I guess there's a legal fight that's been going on mm -hmm. between the the USDA over some food safety regulations, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. So I'm just kind of getting the gist of it off of Lancaster Online. So yeah. first one I picked, pulled up. So that was basically that's pretty much I think the story that you. Yeah, I don't know that particular story, but but there certainly mm -hmm. have been on and off. Mm -hmm conflicts but nonetheless the, my basic point is only that the Amish are a very different culture mm -hmm. and have managed to maintain a very different culture the Romani mm -hmm. I think are gradually breaking down and as I interpret it they're breaking down because our culture our, our, our the, the, the the outside society is too tolerant the, mm -hmm. the the Romani sort of strategy for maintaining their identity partly dependent on the fact that everybody who wasn't a Romani hated the Romani and everybody who was a Romani hated everybody else who wasn't a Romani and that made it fairly easy to keep control over their own people and and mm -hmm. enforce their own rules on them and that's no longer not true in the U.S. and I think as I interpreted at least the Romani culture is gradually uh, melding into the general culture but but the Amish don't seem to be so far uh, mm -hmm. anyway uh, I'm not sure what the, the the real point of this is, but except that that I don't think that you can't have diversity in a in a modern society because I see quite a lot of diversity in a modern society. Okay. Um, how do you feel about the the subject of national divorce? Of national divorce. Yes. Mm -hmm. National divorce. Do you do you mean uh, separating yourself from the government? Oh uh, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think it is unlikely that that, that will be permitted. Uh, the last time it was attempted, it resulted mm -hmm. in quite a lot of unpleasantness. I um, concur on that one. I think there'll be a uh, the federal government will do what they did in 1860. They will raise an army. Well, they have they an are army not, already. Yeah, no, but, exactly. they will. They yeah. will raise a bigger army. Yeah. and yes. use what they have. Yeah, what what might be more nearly possible, and I suppose to some extent already happens, is divorce in the sense of city or state law not enforcing federal law. So if you think about cities that say that they are, what's the term? Not not Sanctuary. refugee cities, but sanctuary cities. What? Sanctuary cities. Sanctuary cities, right? Yep. Exactly. Yep. That what they're in effect saying is. Uh, we will do our best to impede the federal government enforcing parts of its laws mm -hmm. that we disapprove of. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that there's in practice a fair amount of that, that, that mm -hmm. I guess marijuana would be the clear case. It's illegal under federal law, illegal under state law in many states. Yep. And in practice, uh, it's pretty openly, at least in some states, it's pretty openly bought, sold, mm -hmm. used, grown, and so forth. So, so that's a case where in effect the states have divorce themselves from the federal government in that mm -hmm. respect. And I could imagine lots of other uh, other things of that sort. But I think a actual divorce, uh, actual secession is not going to happen unless you have a real collapse of the existing system. Mm -hmm. That's what I think is very likely in the near future. So Agreed. should that the monetary system capitulate and there are alternative monetary systems do you think that society will be able to go its go see its separate way peacefully, or do you think they'll try to uh, reintegrate? And uh, I'm not I'm not sure I understand your question. Are you saying if the dollar becomes worthless, what will happen? Yes, because of the yes. the, the, sure, the if we had inflation and the dollar became worthless. Yes, I expect that people in the U.S. would either 
adopt one or more foreign currencies. Mm -hmm. uh, if there was a cryptocurrency that worked reasonably well, which I'm not sure there is at the moment, uh, that is one where it was inexpensive to transact in it and where the value was fairly stable. They might go mm -hmm. to that. Uh, they could even use, you know, gold coins if they wanted, although gold's a little expensive at this point. So they have to be pretty mm -hmm. small coins for most purposes. Uh, sure. Actually, there is there is someone uh, at, at Porkfest. There's, there was somebody selling uh, paper currency, which had gold in it. It was basically really? made in such a way that there was really? a thin layer of gold in it. And I think oh. I think the they were selling it for something like twice the value of the gold. But I could imagine if you really had a situation where uh, mm -hmm. the dollar collapsed, maybe somebody could establish something like that, which mm -hmm. was a commodity currency uh, with very small amounts of the commodity. But there are certainly lots of ways you can run a monetary system without the government having anything to do with mm -hmm. it. Because there have been... Uh, various past examples that when Adam Smith was writing, the Scottish money was private banknotes uh, backed by silver. Now, what is um, my question to follow up on that is what is uh, what is your notion with uh, something like Bitcoin cash being utilized as a sort of like that crypto form of cash or medium of exchange for the next uh, the next generation? If say the dollar I, were to I haven't followed I haven't followed the different uh, cryptocurrencies carefully mm -hmm. enough. Uh, mm -hmm. and one of the things you want is a currency where transaction costs are low as they are for dollars mm -hmm. and I do not know if any of the cryptocurrencies have achieved that one of the things you would like to have is a currency where the value was reasonably predictable so that you could make contracts in it, for example, for the future and mm -hmm. know what you were agreeing to pay. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that, that I would like to have that current money does not have is an anonymous cryptocurrency, one where there was no way that a third party could know what transactions who was having with whom. And there have been there, there are a couple of anonymous cryptocurrency projects and one of them at least claims to have done it. And I have I don't really know enough about it to be sure if that claim is 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 I, justified or not. I uh, think that was uh, Monero, I believe. Monero is, is one of the two. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. uh, Monero, Monero, Zcash, Dash, yeah. and there are yeah, several think, other ones. Yeah, I think there Zcash was the other. other one that I was thinking yeah. of. Yeah, but, it's one of those two. It might be but, Zcash. It might be. But but I, I get it. But, but the answer is that if 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 one of these turns out to be something which works conveniently and has a reasonably mm -hmm. predictable value, then I don't see any reason why it shouldn't shouldn't end up mm -hmm. as, as as a working working currency. Uh, you yeah, know, I had on my blog a few years ago my own scheme for how you get a cryptocurrency with stable value, and mm. uh, and that that one depended on stable relative to the dollar, which is probably not what you want if the dollar is collapsing. Mm -mm. Uh, yeah, mm -mm. but I think there are ways. There are ways that one could uh, do that, and but at this point, I was interested in in the cryptocurrencies when they first came out because I'd written about private, well, first. Anonymous digital current digital cash is an older idea than cryptocurrencies that mm -hmm. I, I'd written about Xiaomi and digital cash and what its implications would be a long time ago. And that was a cash that was denominated in dollars or some other money, but was set up so that I could pay money to you in such a way that you didn't have to know who I was. I didn't have to know who you were and no third mm -hmm. party could observe it. And that has very interesting potential effects on what your society is like. That's uh, what I think of as a world of strong privacy or part of it. It's uh, what a friend of mine referred to as crypto anarchy quite a long time ago. Uh, yes, but uh, the, but anyway, but, but those are certainly possibilities if the dollar collapses. If the dollar doesn't collapse, uh, aside from privacy, uh, you know, uh, credit cards denominated in dollars work quite well for transactions and make it easy mm -hmm. to buy stuff online. That's what most of us mm -hmm. do, I suspect. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is, I think, a lot of inertia to a monetary system that once people are used to using one, unless it goes works very badly, uh, they're going to stick with it. But if you think about the mm -hmm. fact that in a country where the inflation rate is, say, 10% a year, which is not enormous it's nothing like a hyperinflation but it's still mm -hmm. 
pretty badly working system. Nonetheless, mm. such a system, people in practice can continue to use their money rather than using dollars or pounds or something else, which they could probably do if they really wanted to. Uh, and part of the reason is that if you've got an inflation rate of 10% a year, that means that if your cash balance is $200 in your wallet, you are paying $20 a year for the privilege of using the same money as everybody else. And that isn't a very high price. Yes, sir. And it's only the cash. That is to say, if with an inflation rate of 10% a year, uh, your stocks are gonna go up at about 10% a year, your land will go up at about 10% a year. If mm -hmm. you have a deposit and a, if you, at least if you have a reasonably competitive banking system, they'll be paying you about 10% a year, a little bit more than 10% a year on your money. Mm -hmm. So it's only mm -hmm. to the extent that you actually have currency uh, that you're being taxed on it. And it's not a, it's not a very high, very high cost until until inflation rates get much higher than that. And that's that's actually what I wanted to ask you about. What the what do you think about the the rising interest rates? Because I know the Federal Reserve just actually just today they just raised it another 0. 0.75. What yeah. do you think about what that I will do to you? I don't think they're going to have any choice. That is to say, mm -hmm. it if if it becomes clear that we're running an inflation rate of something like eight percent a year, mm -hmm. people are not going to be lending money at a interest rate of minus 6% a year, which is what you're yeah. getting if the interest rate is 2% and, and the mm -hmm. inflation rate is 8%. Uh, so, you know, people talk as if the Fed was could control interest rates, but it really can't. It can control yeah. the interest rates yeah. that it lends at, but limited by the fact that they've got to be consistent with the overall market for, for loans. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so... Uh, we will see what happens, but but yes. uh, but I expect that the, that interest rates, unless unless the current inflation turns out to be a flash in the pan, which I don't expect, uh, mm -hmm. I think interest rates are going to go up to what maybe ten percent a year or so, something like that, yes. and that's yes. going to raise a problem, of course, for the federal government mm -hmm. because the federal government has a very large national debt at the moment. Mm -hmm. so it's true in a sense the higher interest rate because inflation doesn't really cost them anything because it means they're inflating away the real value of the national debt mm -hmm. but from a mechanical standpoint they still got to pay that interest mm -hmm. uh, yes, and logically speaking they could say all right we'll pay the interest we'll just keep borrowing more money and keep the real value of the debt about the same because the real value is going down 10 percent a year if inflation rate is 10 percent a year mm -hmm. Uh, sir, sir, but I think um, we're up against the hard wall. If you give us a second for our sponsor spot, we'll be sure. right back. All Thank right. You.
Sorry about that. I sent you a message on Facebook. I wasn't sure if you'd uh, I saw it. I wasn't quite sure when I was supposed to restart, but yeah, oh, you're, uh, you're, you're fine. All right. So uh, if you, we'll go ahead and go back to your the point you were making. Before we cut you off. Sorry yeah, about sorry that. about that. Yes, I'm trying to remember now what was the point that I was making before you cut me off. Uh, just sorry. that that one could that if if the dollar becomes oh the, the point the was the dollar that, becomes that, that if and... if we have a if we in fact have an inflation rate of eight or ten percent a year for a while which doesn't seem unlikely but we'll see uh, mm -hmm. and interest nominal interest rates will go up to take account of that and if nominal interest rates go up that means that interest on the federal debt will go up by a lot uh, mm -hmm. several times as high. And in a world unconstrained by politics, that wouldn't matter very much because <clears throat> the government would then say, look, we can <clears throat> borrow, we can run a deficit of, an, of, of, of roughly 10% of the current debt each year, use that to pay the interest. And it's true that the nominal debt is then going up by 10% a year, but since the value of the dollar is going down by 10% a year, the real debt is staying the same. But I suspect that that's complicated enough, so it would be politically difficult, mm -hmm. and that therefore the government is going to find itself in a real hole when they have to either raise taxes sizably, cut spending sizably, or run an extraordinarily high deficit, and which they will do, I do not know. So if they were to go that route, um, would it be plainly easy to see that that could be a dangerous route even further for like individuals' negative rights or their natural rights? That is to say, if they, raise, if they raise taxes, that's mm -hmm. a uh, problem since people would like to keep their money themselves to spend mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of sort of dangers for rights, I'm more worried about the current very sharp political division in the U.S. because, you know, if you believe that 40% uh, of the country are horrible people who uh, are worthless, which at some, in some sense each side now believes of a different 40%, uh, mm -hmm. then that creates a situation where you have the power, you're likely to be rather unkind to people. Um, yes. And, and it kind of, oh. I mean, there's a sense in which I really... I don't believe in prophecy very much anyway, because the world is a very complicated place. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, I figure I know what will happen for about the next 10 years or so. And I'm not even sure that's true here, that that uh, what's going to happen. For example, suppose Trump gets uh, convicted of a crime, which seems to be entirely possible, uh, mm -hmm. and he goes to jail. Uh, to what extent will his supporters say, all right, all stops are out? Uh, mm -hmm. The enemy is using the legal system to get our guy, and we mm -hmm. should be willing to do anything at all, including illegal things, to get them. And then things could get violent very quickly. And mm -hmm. similarly, in the other direction, if 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 Trump doesn't end up in jail and wins mm -hmm. the next election, uh, we saw last time that Trump was in in office, the degree to which people were willing to behave in a way they would normally have disapproved of. Uh, because mm -hmm. he, they saw him as such a terrible threat, and that's going to be even more true this time. So, you know, little details like telling the truth in the newspaper went out the window then, uh, mm -hmm. and so so that that's the sort of thing. You know, there's this famous Adam Smith quote that uh, I think it was may have been the Battle of Yorktown, but one of the uh, one of the American w victories in the Revolutionary War that when the news got to Scotland, one of Smith's students came to him and said, Mr. Smith, this will be the ruin of England. And Smith replied, young man, there's a lot of ruin in a nation. So in that sense, I think people tend to overestimate how unstable the world is. Uh, but I'm not sure that in this case, we, we, we may not be actually facing serious threats of, of breakdowns of ordinary social order. And I think that's the goal is to try, we're trying to navigate a very dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. and we're trying it's the way. That, so, like, I think the the intended purpose of the cryptocurrency uh, space was like, say, if you if you know you're going to crash a plane, you want to try to land it as smoothly as possible. You don't 
and it, mm-hmm. it was like it was hijacked and there was that diverge between bitcoin core and bitcoin cash and mm-hmm. it was like i said initially they were trying to land the plane as smoothly as possible so there was a, a, at least the amount of violence and carnage in the that I think hijacking, cryptocurrency, cryptocurrencies yeah. are a very clever idea but i don't believe that they're going to what's going to save the world so to speak uh, well because if the dollar goes their cryptocurrencies would be one elegant solution to the problem, but there are lots of other solutions that are available. Yes. You could, we could just yes. use somebody else's money. You, you know? don't just use one solution. You had to have multiple solutions. Multiple. Yep. Whether I have to, you, you in fact do. That is to yeah. say, mm-hmm. uh, it's all again, Yes, if we had a hyperinflation, but uh, insofar as it got bad enough, so people wanted to stop using dollars, uh, they could switch to using pounds or euros yeah. or swiss francs or whatever else they thought was mm-hmm. more yeah. reliable so um uh let's finish my point real quick like yeah. i said it was hijacked it seems like and at least this is because i'm i've been following this since the beginning um instead of landing smoothly on the runway it's more like we're running into a brick wall with that as opposed to bitcoin cash which is trying to implement this this system where, where we can all get off the boat safely and land mm-hmm. rel- with with minimal uh violent, i just i just com- have not, conflict i have not followed the things happening in the cryptocurrencies mm-hmm. carefully enough to have any yes, opinion on, the, on understand, the, understand. the Ethereum change or the cryptocurrency uh fork or whatever it was i think it was yes, the fork mm-hmm. that happened yes, or whatever mm-hmm. i i just uh the idea of cryptocurrencies is very neat, uh, yes. but it's it, it it takes a good deal of time and effort to really follow what's happening and have an opinion, and I have not. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Well, well, I mean, a, time is expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Well, it's it's also dangerous going down that route, too, because then you could, you could uh, kind of, well, like you said, hijack. You can pollute it with your own system, and then we're in the talks of a, of a digital digitalized dollar system that isn't anonymous and then you have then you have the full scale of uh of complete control over everything every facet of life with yeah well i'd be happy to have to have a privately issued non-anonymous currency which was denominated Mm -hmm. in dollars that would Mm -hmm. be very convenient that would be the equivalent of what Mm -hmm. we now do with uh, credit cards there you go Uh, but it would not depend on the stability of uh, the rest of the framework and mm-hmm. if as long as the as long as we're talking about the kind of inflation rates we are now talking about, which are something mm-hmm. like eight or ten percent, I don't yeah. think that they give an adequate incentive for people to switch to a different money. Mm-hmm. Sure. But it just isn't worth the trouble. I mean, similarly, I've been following in, online encryption more or less from the beginning. Uh, yes, and but I don't, in fact, encrypt anything. Yeah, as I don't have a whole lot of secrets, uh, and it's a nuisance to set things up so that all your email is encrypted and all the people who you uh, with, with mm-hmm. your private key and all the people you want to correspond with have your public key, and you can do it in principle. And I've been <laughs> writing and talking about that stuff for a very long time, but I don't actually do it because it isn't worth the trouble. Yeah, and, and that's going to be true of alternative currencies unless this one goes very badly mm-hmm. which could happen i mean i i i am not sure i know what the limits are of how badly mm-hmm. the fed can yeah. can manage the monetary system but we'll mm-hmm. see so with with that um what is uh what is your opinion on agorism the idea of counter economics that is a very long time ago, I thought the idea of an agoric society, of a society where instead of firms, everything was done in effect by contract among individuals, sounded like a really neat idea. Mm-hmm. And I was wrong. That is, it's a cute idea. It makes a nice story. Mm-hmm. But there are reasons, in a sense, it was tried. Uh, there's mm-hmm. a very interesting discussion in one of the, I don't remember whose book it is, uh, I think Oliver Williamson. Uh, Mm -hmm. markets and hierarchies of the inside contracting system in the 19th century. So you want Mm -hmm. to make a rifle. So you have a building with like four different firms in it. And one of the firms makes the stock and one Mm -hmm. of them makes the barrel 
and one of them makes the receiver and one of them buys from the other three assembles and markets. Mm -hmm. And that is certainly a way of doing things. Mm -hmm. But there are some disadvantages to that because it means that the people mm -hmm. who are doing the buying and marketing know that if any of the other three have something go wrong with them, if they stop producing, you're suddenly ha have nothing to sell. Mm -hmm. uh, so that there is, and this really goes back to a classic article by Ronald Coase on the nature of the mm -hmm. firm, that there are both advantages and disadvantages to hierarchical organization mm -hmm. as against the market. And the problem with the market is that uh, you have transaction costs, bargaining with people you're buying and selling from, and you may be at the mercy of how they run their firms if you're dependent on them for your inputs. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is something to be said for moving the inputs in-house and producing them yourself. And there really is mm -hmm. a trade-off. And Koch's argument was that what determines the size of firms is that firms grow until they reach the point at which the inefficiencies due to hierarchical organization start being larger than the efficiencies due to hierarchical organization or the inefficiencies due to doing the same thing on the market. Uh, mm. So in that sense, you could have an agoric system uh, under particular circumstances if you have an economy where there are no things that require the coordination of very many people. But mm -hmm. once you require the sort of coordination where if you stop doing your part, I suddenly can't do my part. Well, you might manage that through the market if I know you well enough to be sure I can trust you to mm -hmm. do what you're doing. But it might make more sense for both of us to be the employees of a firm, uh, which is which is controlling the whole process. So I think I am less positive about that vision of an economy than I was what roughly 50 years ago when I wrote my first mm -hmm. book. So, but uh, with that being the case, because there are obviously there are some disadvantages. Would agorism, um, in theory, be a way to co-regulate the, uh, the strategy for an anarcho-capitalist system within the market? I'm not sure I understand you. Are you talking about how within the existing society you end up with mm -hmm. a? Yeah, well, that of course in a sense happens already that is to say people mm -hmm. do transactions mm -hmm. off the books as it were mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes that's in effect a barter system i will do something for you and you'll do something for me uh, mm -hmm. uh, i'll uh, <clears throat> babysit your kids uh, monday wednesday and friday and you'll babysit my kids tuesday thursday and saturday that kind of thing happens mm -hmm. and all of that is an agoric system but mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to displace the ordinary economy with that. I think that you're going to have what now happens, that parts of the economy already run that way. Uh, mm -hmm. That now my standard example of a modern gift economy uh, and the puzzle, in a sense, of why we have it is uh, we invite another couple over for dinner and we have a good dinner. And they feel an obligation to invite us over for dinner. And if it's not convenient to do that, they'll take us out to dinner at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. It would never occur to them to say, well, we, we, we owe you a debt for that trouble. Here's 20 bucks. Yeah. It would feel wrong to us in terms of our culture, mm -hmm. shared culture. I'm not entirely sure I know why, but it's, but it's an observation about how people feel. So that is, in a sense, a, a, a gift economy inside our regular economy. And there are other examples of that, of uh, people doing things things for each other on on a non-market basis i'm going to be doing some chauffeuring for my grandchildren uh mm -hmm. next week uh because their father is going to be out of town and they live close enough so that i can do the driving for a day uh so so a lot of that happens but i think the sort of vision of thinking that you're going to replace the ordinary economy with with uh, individualist market structures is not very likely I'm a very conservative anarchist. That is to say, I yes, yes sir. I, I don't think um, that, that things are going to change very radically, very fast. And I think it is worth thinking about where you want to end up, but you're not likely to end up there tomorrow. Well, I don't want to. Uh, you know, we don't want things to disintegrate like instantaneously. No. We want to have structured. Yes, and there was implementations of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. it, there was a, a review of my first book done by a blogger who I think highly of, Scott Alexander. Yes, and it was, it was sort of a friendly but critical review. 
but the, his last comment was, I hope the system described is established somewhere far from me. Yes, sir. And mm -hmm. in a sense, I agree with him that we yeah. don't know in advance. Human societies are very complicated. And mm -hmm. I can say, well, here is my best guess of how it would work. And here is my reason to think it would work better than what we have. I don't really know. And I'd much mm -hmm. rather have somebody else do the experiment and then we can yeah. take advantage of their experience and, and mm -hmm. copy it. Uh, so nobody right. wants to be a bad neighbor. We want to, mm -hmm. you know, slowly integrate different cultural perspectives and stuff like that mm -hmm. so that we can all be good neighbors. Uh -huh. But at, at the same time, we can't hijack the monetary system. This is just my perspective. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and to implement our understanding of what a good neighbor is over other people. Well, you can you you can use cryptocurrency yourself if you want. Yeah. It's not that it's being a bad neighbor. It's just that you are not in fact going to be able to persuade most other people to use it, and therefore yeah. you want to buy an ice cream cone at the uh, nearest uh, Baskin and, and Robbins. You'd better have uh, U.S. currency to do it with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the the best part is is uh, perspective. Like everybody has one, so. Yeah. we can utilize it mm -hmm. yeah. but with the acknowledgement that uh you may have to integrate yourself into their perspective even if it's yeah. just for a time there's always going to be non-conformists i mean there's mm -hmm. uh, i'm not sure if you know much about the enneagram um but you know there are people who who want just to be left alone people who don't want to be left alone i want to initiate violence and force to, mm -hmm. and that's expensive so we're, our, our idea at the Legacy Right is to try to find that, just provide information for people to consider as mm -hmm. more like a middle ground to understand and distribute ideas. So that's basically what our program was up about today. That sums it up. All right. So mm -hmm. anything else you want to talk about? Um, uh, Andrew, you got a question? I think I got a question. I, so you go you go well. I've got yeah. the, that other second quote from Max Turner I want to get your perspective on. Uh, but I'll I'll let Zach go first. Well I was um I was I'm curious on uh, the issue of uh, borders and and the dispute of property all within like a, a an open market and do borders should borders even matter um you mean national borders or the border yeah. around my from around my lot uh national borders because i believe that your your border around your lot matters it matters yes. to you well but if you really had a a a, a stateless society then there wouldn't mm -hmm. be national borders in that sense mm -hmm. Uh, there might be borders larger than a lot. It might be that a group of people who owned adjacent houses would agree, mm -hmm. you know, here's a line here, 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 we're going to put a wall around our collection of houses and have, mm -hmm. we have that now. After all, you've got, you know, walled uh, developments, mm -hmm. uh, gated communities. <clears throat> uh, so that could certainly happen. But I think mm -hmm. that short of, of an anarchist society that, there isn't very much reason to have borders at to have boundaries to have barriers at borders, except when troops are trying to come through. Mm -hmm. That that, I, that that I'm in general in favor of free immigration uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and free trade. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as I can tell, in both cases, you're making people worse off on net by the restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, people mm -hmm. worry legitimately that if you have free immigration, people will come in order to go go on welfare. But the mm -hmm. solution to that is to say that you're welcome to come, but you do not automatically get the right to get all of the benefits of being a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. And ideally, you don't pay all the taxes of being a U.S. citizen. That is what I proposed a very long time ago, mm -hmm. is that the new immigrant can't collect welfare, but his taxes are reduced by whatever fraction of the taxes where he is go to pay for welfare. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That that one of the weird things about the present situation is that illegal immigrants are really giving the rest of us a free ride because some of them at least pretend to be legal re residents, therefore pay social security taxes, but can't collect social security. Yep. Uh, 
and I would prefer a system in which they neither pay social security taxes nor collect it, which of course is what the Amish have. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. um, the Amish who are self-employed or Amish who are employed by Amish employers uh, are free from social security. Uh, Amish who are employed by other people, I think have to pay social security taxes. I think that's the present situation as I understand it. Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, the quote, the other second quote that I was talking about earlier that I wanted to get your perspective on is, uh, how can one steal a property that doesn't exist? What belongs to no one cannot be stolen. You don't steal the water that uh, is drawn from the sea. Consequently, property is not theft, but theft is only possible through property. And it's, uh, like I said, that's a very narrow quote. But that I seems to, to imply that, that not only that the ocean is property, but nothing else is either. Yes, and uh, I would have said as an economist that there are advantages to treating things as property and there are disadvantages, that there are some things such as the ocean that are commons in the sense that anybody can take ocean water and nobody else has a claim to object to their doing so. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are other things that are property. And there are reasons that basically, just as I was saying before, that there are uh, costs as well as benefits to uh, market transactions as opposed to internal hierarchy for a firm. Similarly, there are costs as well as benefits to treating something as property. There's, there's an interesting old article whose title was The Approximate Optimality of Aboriginal Property Rights. Yes, and it was looking at primitive mm -hmm. societies and some primitive societies have property rights in land and some don't. And it's tempting for us to say, well, Property rights and land are obviously a sensible arrangement. The ones who don't are just too primitive to have thought of it. But it turns out that there are actually primitive societies that have pro private property and land part of the year. And once you think about it, you realize that whether private property and land makes sense depends on what you're using the land for. That if you want to grow grain, you want to be able to say, all right, I planted it and you don't get to harvest it. But if what you're doing is chasing uh, large animals uh, across through the jungle, you don't really want to have to stop every time you come into somebody's property line and get permission to trespass because the, the deer will get away while you're doing that. Yeah. So but, if that's yeah. how you're using the land, you might want property rights in <clears throat> deer under pursuit. You might want to say, if I'm chasing the deer, you don't get to wait till I'm tired and then you see me going by and so you chase the deer, kill it, and eat it. You might mm -hmm. want to have rules along those lines, but you don't really want property rights in land. And if the land is being used part of the year for one purpose and part of the year for another, it may make sense to have property rights uh, part of the year. I spend part of one chapter of my my book, Law's Order, discussing the discussing the general issue that that one of my favorite examples is the English language. That you could imagine a a, a intellectual property regime in which words were private property. And in a very limited sense, if you think about uh, trademarks and such, to some extent they are, but mostly they aren't. And there would be advantages to that because there are faults of the English language which could be corrected. Well, my standard example here is that English has no gender neutral pronouns. There's no way of saying in a single word, he or she. And you could imagine if words were private property, that some, some entrepreneur would hire some linguists to figure out what was the perfect gender neutral pronoun. What was the one that once you heard it, it would be obvious what it meant. Mm -hmm. And they could then spend money promoting that pronoun till people started using it. And after the first year, charge a nickel to anybody who used it. Yes, and that would mm -hmm. be a market incentive to improve the language. But it also has rather large transaction costs. If every time you want to say anything, you've got to first license every word separately from the owner. Mm -hmm. So it would not be an improvement. So that's a reason why it makes sense to treat the English language as a commons, uh, but other things as as property. So I, I spend mm -hmm. as I, say, I spend part of a chapter in Law's Order, which people can read a late draft of from my webpage for free if they want. Mm -hmm. uh, I should say my webpage is daviddfriedman.com and it's got lots of interesting stuff that people may want to look at, uh, including medieval recipes because one of my and my family's hobbies is cooking from very old cookbooks. So well, that's a lots of interesting yes. hobby. Yes, mm -hmm. I actually want to pick that up. <laughs> um, so, 
I'm going to go hunt down a recipe right now, actually. <laughs> well, if you go on, on my webpage and it starts out with four worlds, mm -hmm. one of which is recreational medievalism or some title like that. Mm -hmm. and if you go there, there is a book called The Miscellany, which has got a whole bunch of stuff that I and my wife have done, including a few hundred recipes. And there's also a cookbook wow. that's just the recipe part of that, of, of, of the miscellany. So mm -hmm. that's that's one of the things we do. Uh, mm -hmm. But it uh, doesn't have a whole lot to do with libertarianism, but it's fun. Yeah. Uh, that's all that matters. Projects, so. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, things, things do connect in the sense that my medieval interests do get me into things like trying to make sense of saga period Iceland, which is interesting for libertarians because it was yeah. a society which you didn't have government law enforcement as we mm -hmm. <laughs> understand it. <clears throat> but mostly I do what I find interesting. and Sometimes it turns out to be useful for other things and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we really appreciate you have, uh, joining us today, oh, sir. Well, thank you. We had I a good time. I enjoyed it. Time. Time. I get to talk to lots of people I wouldn't talk to otherwise somewhere out there in in virtual reality. So was this being broadcast live? Uh, no, uh, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna. Edit so if it. if that's the case, why do you have to have a break for your your ad thing? Uh because we, what we do is we implement it on uh on onto an audio uh yeah an audio platform. audio podcast. That's yeah we can't we can't pluck it out of. Uh, it's tied to it's, anchor because we yeah. utilize anchor. So. All right. Well, however, so, so, <laughs> so we, we put it up we're on kinda, YouTube. So yeah, however you do it. But anyway, have a nice day and thank you for your hospitality. Thank, thank, thank you again, sir, for joining us, sir. Uh, expanded knowledge once more. Thank yeah. you. Always trying to, you know, give them different perspectives and opinions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a little aggressive sometimes, but at the same time, we had to give him the opportunity to be, to, you know, correct us. You had to think the other, from a different, different view, a point, a point of view. So, exactly. Exactly. And that's, uh, that's what the best part of being human is, right? Yeah. We all have different integrated ideas and without, one person's ideas and oh this goes back to the market actually one person has an idea the other person has an idea the third person has an idea and so on and so forth you you yeah. you exchange those ideas so yeah <clears throat> uh, well thanks for visiting us again thanks for listening thanks for watching uh this is a legacy right make sure to hit us up on telegram on don't Bible's miss crack house. And don't miss that uh, don't don't miss that bumper that he's gonna put in and in, in between for the YouTube segment because yeah boy are they either intriguing, insightful, or absolutely hilarious. He picks them. I don't I don't do I don't I don't do a <laughs> lick of anything on it. So what do you what do you believe in? <laughs> so, but like I said, oh, I'd like to. I, uh, again, I, I love to thank David Friedman for coming on and uh, love to thank Andrew for continuing continuously doing this with me. And uh, yeah, it's, it's always fun bringing on uh, new people. interesting heads, yeah. interesting heads and a column of new people. Giants is what they yeah. are. So, you know, David Freeman is so, definitely a giant, you know, in the field. He so. is a he is a giant, and we are just little ants. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, you know, yeah. So, and in order to grow to become a giant ant, we got to consume all that knowledge. So, it's been wonderful. Until next time, thanks for joining us. We'll see you. I uh, will see you when we see you. Peace. See ya. And me and Mesa says peace too. <laughs> I'm a wise wolf. I know I'm wise <laughs> because I don't know that I know anything. <laughs> that's 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 a butcher quote. Mm -hmm. You have to watch the YouTube video to see it. Bye. <laughs>